Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, there is a lot of talk right now around autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles. And I wanted to try and demystify some of the complex tech out there and try and make sense of that industry. And that path and my curiosity led me to a company called Syngin, spelled C-Y-N-G-N. And they are a developer of innovative autonomous driving solutions for industrial and commercial enterprises. And they also recently announced a partnership with the Columbia Vehicle Group. And Sinjin's autonomous vehicle capabilities are powered by something called DriveMod, which is their end-to-end solution that can be integrated with Columbia vehicles, or in fact, any vehicle at all. But enough scene setting from me. Buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to sunny San Diego, where Lyo Tao, Sinjin CEO, is waiting to share their story, expand on their partnership with Columbia, and the current trends that are shaping the market. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Hi, Neil. Thank you for having me here. So my name is Lior. Uh, I was born and grew up in Israel. I went to a law school and business school there. Um, and then I moved to the U.S. about 10 years ago, uh, following the acquisition of my previous company, snap to by Facebook. Uh, snap to uh, developed uh, technology for feature phones, And Facebook was becoming, starting to become a mobile company back then. And it was a great synergy. Um, They acquired the company. We moved everyone to California. And and that became really the foundation for Facebook's mobile product line. I think, um, uh, you know, these uh, several years later, there's been over a billion people that's been using that product since. Uh, I spent the five years between 2011 and 2016 at Facebook, uh, building and growing their international uh, growth and partnerships team. Um, and then in 2016, I, uh, I took on the role of CEO at Syngen, which is a Silicon Valley company um, that uh, develops software and data for autonomous driving with focus on industrial and commercial applications. Now, we offer the software and we work in collaboration with the industrial vehicle manufacturers to offer end customers you know, like, uh, like Walmart and, and their peers uh, a full autonomous vehicle solution. Wow, incredibly cool. So as you said there, that path led you to Syngin, which is the developer of innovative autonomous driving solutions for industrial and commercial enterprises. But could you set the scene a little bit and and tell the listeners that are hearing about Syngin for the very first time, a little bit more about the kind of problems that, uh, that you're solving with technology there? Sure, of course. You know, let me take a step back because I think the problem that we're solving um, is sort of an evolution of you know, different companies I built over the years and, and how I think about technology. And, you know, it all starts back in the early 80s where my father brought home the Sinclair Spectrum, the ZX82, the legendary little device. And it really opened my eyes back then to software and communication and the really the connected world before everything we see today. Um, and throughout these companies, the, the common thread, I think, that really attracts me over and over again is the, the concept of impact how you can build something that touches so many people's lives, right? And how, how you know, a company can really transform the world, uh, hopefully, uh, to the good. And, you know, at Syngen, one of the things we realized early on is the huge potential of autonomous driving. And the fact that there is no question it will reshape the world for everything from the open roads, to real estate. If, uh, you know, people are following the Mars, uh, um, uh, the Mars mission, you know, the, these rovers that operate there, it's going to touch everything that moves. Um, but where we really think it's going to make landfall in a meaningful commercial scaled way is in the industrial world. And the reason is that autonomous driving solves a very fundamental problem that uh, enterprises have, and that's a reliance on massive, massive human workforces. And I think today it's in the headlines. You see, you know, I think only in the past week we've seen articles uh, talking about the Pope being involved in Biden and like everyone touching the problem of labor shortage, that's really been heightened by the pandemic. Um, and, and, you know, these millions of people are the backbone of uh, industries doing repetitive, physical, mundane work, um, which is really not what we're great at. 
right? We are creative thinkers, we're problem solvers. And when you combine the two, you end up with uh, massive issues um, such as um, safety problems that come from human error originated accidents, uh, productivity loss because of uh, labor shortage, and of course, um, the, the main problem of the cost of labor that amasses to hundreds of billions of dollars um, in the US only. So, you know, when we started working on autonomous driving, we thought, let's build a system that can be broadly applied, whether you're in a mine, a warehouse, uh, that solves that human driver uh, problem. And it can be used to augment the drivers to make things safer. It can be used to add a third shift if you don't have people that uh, work the graveyard shift, or it can be used to replace people in cases where that makes sense, um, you know, for either cost or uh, or risk issues. You know, we have uh, companies reaching out to us, for example, in mining to do explosive uh, placement, autonomous trucks, things like that. So the problem we really took on is, you know, how to solve the, the human problem of, uh, the industrial world. And just to bring to life some of what you're talking about there, I'm curious, do you have any, I don't know, use cases that you could share that will just help people listening understand how DriveMod, which is your autonomous driving solution, can actually be deployed on mul- multiple vehicle types in, in various environments? You've mentioned everything from, from roads to space there in, in Mars, but are there any uh, use cases that spring to mind? So the big problem with uh, autonomous driving is focus. How to choose yeah. the one thing to go after uh, before you move and jump to the second and third thing. You know, before I started uh, scoping the product and really uh, building it, um, I went and I talked to probably 30 different companies across the different industrial spectrum from, um, you know, theme parks to logistics and manufacturing and defense and really asked them if I could automate anything in your, uh, in your workflow, what would that be? And it was, this was five years ago, a little over five years ago. And it's amazing how each of them really had a ready answer to what is their biggest problem uh, that uh, automation, autonomy can solve. And then uh, we went and designed a system that can support the superset of these different applications. As long as they're inside the industrial space, we don't do open road, passenger, robotics, that's, um, you know, uh, problems other companies are solving. Um, and then we spend the next five years to develop a system that can do multiple applications. Now, as we're moving to, to our next uh, stage of, uh, let's say, evolution from R&D and prototyping and taking it out to the first select customers, uh, where we really narrow down our focus for the next couple of years is what's called the industrial material handling. And that's moving things in large facilities, uh, you know, vehicles like payloaders and stock chasers and even forklifts in very large distribution centers, manufacturing uh, facilities. Um, from an autonomous driving problem aspect, it's simpler than than operating on the road. These environments are more structured. Uh, things are slower. People are more disciplined. So it's a smaller problem, but it is massive in the impact it makes. Uh, like I said, in the US alone, there are millions of these vehicles operating each year. There's about a million new ones sold per year. And the cost of drivers to operate them is, uh, I think, about $120 billion um, alone. So this is the first problem we, we are set to actually um, deploying commercially our software with our vehicle partners' vehicles. And then from that point on, you know, we will make a decision on how much we want to expand uh, either to more applications inside the same sites or horizontally to other types of sites, other types of applications. But at this point, really, it's a matter of focus, getting it into that commercial scale stage before taking on other problems. And before you came on the podcast, I was doing a little bit of research and I came across a story about your recent partnership with Columbia. So could you expand on that and and what it means to you all at Syngin there? So, you know, the one thing I did learn um, in the different uh, products and companies I built is that you're more likely to succeed if you build something that doesn't exist and you are really great at what you're doing. And what we developed is software, we're a software and data company. We are great at that. Uh, our software is better than uh, than you know others that are out there. Um, we're not great at building vehicles, and for us to really build a great solution, it requires the best software with the best vehicle. So one of our go-to-market um, you know fundamental principles is we work in collaboration with the industrial vehicle manufacturers, and together we can offer the end customer the best vehicle with the best software. They can really also take advantage of their 
supply chain, their service network, their, their financing capabilities. Um, Colombia is our leading uh, partner when it comes to industrial vehicles. They've been selling uh, industrial vehicles to Fortune 100 companies for 70 years. They're a great company. And they acknowledge the fact that uh, their customers are asking for automation, autonomy, intelligence. Um, and for them, the best uh, approach to you know, answer that demand is through partnerships. So you know, we, we're very happy with that partnership. We are uh, already working uh, on, the, um, on the mutual development of the second vehicle platform. The first one was a stock chaser. The second one is a larger one, a payloader. Um, initially, we can work with them. We are working with them on retrofitting existing fleets that really helps a customer adopt the technology without needing to replace their vehicles. And over time, their vehicles are going to come off the line with uh, the enablement for our software to support them. So there's an evolution over this partnership over time. And at Sinjin, you have been operating autonomous vehicles in production environments since, I think, way back in 2017. But, of course, we're at that time of the year now where we've got one, one eye on the following year and looking at what trends that we might see in the industry. So I'm curious, as someone right in the heart of this space, what trends are you seeing and, and what do you think we will dominate 2022 and beyond? Is there anything that uh, you've seen and anything that excites you? You know, having worked on this for I think close to six years now, yeah. um, as you're in the midst of it, everything feels alive and moving. When you look backward, you can start identifying the trends, right? This is where you can start seeing the, seeing the things uh, shape a direction. Um, you know, back then in 2016, there was only one laser scanning sensor provider, right? You can either buy from them or not have it. Uh, fast forward today, there are multiple providers, many of them offering similar products, some of them already public. Uh, so I think that the, the one thing that makes it easier for us to really reach that next scaled phase is the, the maturation of the supply chain and the subsystem sub, subcomponents. Um, our system you know, is abstract from the vehicle and the sensors, so we can work on pretty much any industrial vehicle and can use pretty much any computing platform or sensors. So, you know, being able to focus on the software and make it um, um, modular in that way really allow, allows us to harness the evolution of that supply chain. But I think the most meaningful thing that we're seeing, and it's really accelerated by the, the pandemic and the understanding that, um, um, you know, humans are really a weakness when it goes to these industrial enterprises, is the adoption of automation. And if you look at companies like Amazon and Foxconn, they're ahead of the curve. They're very disruptive. They're adopting robotics and automation and intelligence uh, for the past five years plus. And what it really gives the companies that can harness these technologies is a huge competitive advantage. Right? And what we're seeing is that companies either identify that and want to be a disruptor in their field or are chasing a company like Foxconn or Amazon. And for them, it's existential. Either adopt the technology, innovate, or be disrupted and become... Uh, um, and just be replaced in that market. And I think 22 is really when these technologies, automation, autonomy, uh, industry 4.0 by large, right, are going to, to be really widely deployed uh, into a wide spectrum of different organizations. And of course, as we come to the end of 2021, it's a time of the year where everyone gets kind of reflective and looks back at the achievements and lessons learned over the past 12 months. And you guys have had a fantastic year and you recently announced the, the closing of your initial public offering. So what excites you about that and, and what does it mean for Sinjin in the future? So it's one, it's a, it's a huge milestone in the maturity of a company, the ability to operate, you know, as a public company, the ability, uh, you know, for us, it was, um, it was, you know, really an achievement to be the first industrial autonomy software company on NASDAQ and really being able to, uh, you know, get to that stage after five years of very hard development. Um, but the thing that, that I think really attracted me the most as we're going through the process and talking to the many institutional investors as part of the roadshow where you market um, the company and the product is, is uh, an amazing amount of people that really believe and are bullish about the impact that autonomous driving can make on the industrial world over a long period of time. And really the like-minded people that, uh, that see the future 
uh, that we see where this is going to just grow and expand horizontally and vertically and take on more and more impact in that world. So I think opening up the uh, investor base in a complex engine, really allowing anyone to be released in that future to join the company, I think is a huge uh, um, um, enabler for us. And in addition, you have the sort of the basic benefits of being a public company, the transparency, the maturity when it goes to partners and customers, they really know who they work with and the liquidity that really allows us to develop our talent and reward them for the hard work they're doing. So like I said, it's an evolution, it's a stage, but from now, you know, the, the, the work just starts as we're moving from that R&D and beta and prototyping into the commercial stage. There's a lot of work ahead of us and we think about this very long term. Absolutely. I think if you're a person, an individual, or if you're an individual or a business, it's that continuous state of evolution that everybody's in right now. And as I said, it's been a hugely successful year for you. So the pressure's going to be on next year to try and top that as it gets harder and harder. But what can we expect from Sinjin in 2022? So the, the three areas that we're going to invest the most is uh, our the first continue developing our great team. Uh, hire great people, expand um, the the really the muscle that allows us to continue developing this very innovative technology be ahead of the curve, but also people that can really deploy it commercially at very high, uh, um, let's say, grade with these customers. So one part of it is the talent. The second part is continue developing the ecosystem of partnerships like Columbia, Formal D, Symbotic, where the great companies that will work with us to put our software in the hands of customers. Um, and the third part is, of course, that engagement with these first select customers, the first ones that are going to receive these industrial material handler built by Columbia with our software and start really integrating them uh, into their uh, uh, workload. And then, you know, that process of the first commercial deployments uh, is planned for the next 18 to 24 months. And then the expectation is 24 onward, really scale deployment uh, and really starting to take the company to realize its potential. Uh, we are a SaaS company. Our revenues will come from licensing the self-driving uh, software. Um, and 24 is when we expect these revenues to really kick in and uh, you know achieve that level of growth uh, that we've been prepping for. Well, I've loved chatting with you today. We began our conversation talking about your origin story. And I now want to finish by asking you, is there a song or piece of music that has inspired you in your career? Or what has been the soundtrack to your uh career in tech is there a song and a story you can share with us and, and we'll add your song to our spotify playlist so i have a recent one this one has been really accompanying me in the last year or so i you know i had the more classic ones early on um but but recently you know i was i was driving in my car and listening to the radio and i heard the song and, and i had that moment oh this is so amazing this is exactly uh you know what we're doing um and this is um a song by Fort Minor called Remember the Name. You know, it's a, it's a rap team and they're talking about music, but, you know, and as I was listening to the chorus, it said, this is so amazing. Amazing. This is everything worthwhile building follows a similar equation in what you need to put into it to make it work. And I'm, I'm going to read you a few lines that really resonated with me. So they're saying, this is 10% luck, 20% skill, 15% concentrated power of will. 5% pleasure, 50 pain, and 100% reason to remember the name. And I think this is exactly, you know, the things that we feel on a day-to-day. -day. Everything worth building takes effort, sweat, fear, excitement, fun. And, and you know, at the end of the day, it all has to come together for something to really um, um, be worth building. So this is my song for the year. Um, let's see, maybe next year I'm going to find a new one. Absolutely love that. And just one more time, could you rap or sing that for me? No. <laughs> <laughs> I won't put you through that. But uh, for anyone listening that wants to find out more information about Sinjin, uh, find you online, uh, check out some of the work you've been doing, contact your team, what's the best starting point? So the easiest is to start on our website, uh, sinjin.com, C-Y-N-G-N. If you really want to hear the full story of uh, the company and, and the IPO, if you go under investor relations, there's the full presentation we shared during the investor conversation it really lays out, um, you know, the problem, the situation, the market and, and our unique uh, approach. Um, you can find us on LinkedIn with the same name on Twitter, on YouTube. There's a lot of videos and interviews. 
out there or just you know find me on linkedin reach out i'm i'm very accessible I'll have those links to the show notes so people can find you nice and easy. Uh, I love chatting with you, talking about the story behind the company, the, the partnership with Columbia, the work you're doing with autonomous vehicles, the current trend shaping the market, but more than anything, your story too, and that great song you've left us with. So thanks for sharing that with me today. Thank you very much, Neil. It's been a pleasure. So Drive Mod enables vehicles to switch easily between manual, remotely controlled and fully autonomous modes. And autonomous vehicle technology is bringing this variety of benefits to industrial organisations by increasing efficiency, continuity and making it easier for workers to stay focused on their most mission critical tasks. So I'm interested in how that pairing of Sinjin's drive mod with Columbia's fleet of electric utility vehicles. I'm interested in finding out what that means for material handling organisations and how they can and what will happen when they begin to implement autonomy, not next year, but right here, right now and what that will lead to. Incredibly cool. But if you're a fan of electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, or you're more of a petrol head and you're concerned where this is going, wherever your interest lies, it's your opinion, your thoughts, insights that are equally as important as mine and the guests today. So please email me, techblogwriter at outlook.com. My website is techblogwriter.co.uk, where you'll find over 2,000 other interviews. And you can also connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. But don't just hit the follow or connect button. Send me a little message. Tell me you've listened to the podcast, what you like, what you dislike, whatever it may be. And we can have a conversation too. But it's time for me to go now. So I return bright and early tomorrow. And a big thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.